This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Today, I'm happy to uh, introduce our first speaker of the sequence. Um, which is Alex Slay. Uh, he is the executive producer at Zynga. I think uh, Zynga is a, a company that needs no introduction. Um, prior, he was the founder and CTO of another firm called Serious Business. Uh, that was acquired into Zynga. Uh, and prior to that, he was at PowerSet. And PowerSet uh, was acquired by Microsoft for uh, some $100 million. PowerSet is a substantial portion of the Bing search engine. Um, therefore, anyway, so um, <laughs> so uh, with with all of this introduction, uh, it's my pleasure and uh, thankful for your time uh, to introduce Alex Lay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Lay. Um, I'm uh, an entrepreneur in San Francisco. I've been, as, as the professor said, I've been working at a couple of different um, areas in the startup world over the past couple of years. I started out in search engines. I started making games kind of on a lark. And now I've been making games at Zynga for a couple of years. I wanted to put this slide up first because uh, I have a funny story about um, my name. I actually. There's actually two Alex Lays in Silicon Valley, and we're both Asian and um, you know socially awkward, and we both do startups. We're both Ruby on Rails programmers. We're both like you know he's like my doppelganger basically. So <laughs> this is what my website looks like. If uh, perchance you Google me, you should not Google me because he has more Google juice than me. Actually, he's he's the top ranked. So click the second link. This is my personal website. This is what it looks like. As the professor said, I, I started out as a student in. Uh, uh, software engineering um, at UCI. Um, at UCI, we didn't have uh, cool entrepreneurship programs like this. And so my uh, entry into the entrepreneurship world was really uh, lucky for me. Um, but I started out as an engineer. Uh, I spent time doing search engine work as, a, as an engineer during school. And my first job out of school was at at t Interactive, where I worked on a local search engine. And I used that to uh, parlay a move into San Francisco, where I always wanted to end up because of the rich startup environment here. I worked at PowerSet. I was a search engine engineer there. And uh, I quickly um, got into gaming kind of by luck. And that's what you know, this, this talk will sort of be about. Unfortunately, I can't talk too much about gaming, uh, specifically at my current job, because Zynga's in uh, IPO quiet period. So. Um, I won't be talking too much about Zynga. It'll be just like basic information. Um, and the questions, if there are questions at the end, can't be too much about Zynga either. Um, so I guess we could just get the uh, show going. Back in 2007, I had just started uh, working up in San Francisco. Um, I was working at PowerSet, which was, at the time, it was one of the hottest startups in uh, the city. Um, it was a Ruby on Rails startup. Ruby on Rails was getting a lot of heat as this great web development uh, platform. Uh, they were being pegged as the Google killer, which was kind of an interesting PR stunt on the part of the founders. Um, and the technology was actually really cool. Uh, they had hired a bunch of researchers from Xerox Park. They had a lot of people in academia working on natural language. PowerSet was kind of at the forefront. Uh, searches where you didn't type in just keywords. You can actually type in real semantic phrases, and PowerSet would figure out what it meant. Um, so that was a lot of fun, and I, I moved here with great hopes of you know, actually killing Google. That didn't pan out to be the case, uh, because search is a really hard problem. And 100 people in San Francisco is nothing like you know, 
10,000 people in Palo Alto or Mountain View. And so uh, pretty quickly, I made some friends at uh, PowerSet. And um, we started working on things on the side kind of just for fun, just to make a little bit of money on the side. Um, I had always grown up wanting to be an entrepreneur uh, because I had grown up during the dot-com bubble. And I actually watched a lot of the talks in this lecture series from the past years. And a lot of the speakers were people who experienced that dot-com bubble. Um, I, I only got to see it from the outside, but it looked really exciting. And I remember being in college and thinking, man, that's so cool. I wish I could just create a you know, payment service and sell it for a billion dollars. Um, it turns out it's a lot harder than that. But um, moving here was a big part of becoming an entrepreneur. And I think it's really important that people always kind of keep uh, projects on the side that they're interested in so that in the off chance that one of those turns into a business that you can really run and operate, you know, that's your chance to become an entrepreneur. And I think that's kind of what happened with us for Friends for Sales. So my co-founder's name is Siki Chen. He was also a search engine engineer at PowerSet. And in 2007, Facebook had just opened up their API for people to develop on. Uh, and we decided we wanted to make apps on the Facebook platform. At the time, things were growing like crazy. There was a lot of buzz. And we decided to make this game called Friends for Sale. Uh, Friends for Sale was an application on Facebook where once you joined the application, we took all of your friends from your Facebook friends list, and we assigned prices to them. And then it was up to you to buy the friends that you wanted to keep as friends. And every person could only have a single owner. So what we did was we ended up creating this market economy around people. And so um, you know, if I joined the site and I have a girlfriend, I would want to buy my girlfriend. But if my friend Siki, who's my co-founder, who's also kind of a jerk, uh, <laughs> joined also, he could buy my girlfriend away from me. And every time that would happen, the value of that person would go up. And so it was, it was this fun uh, market economy around people's, people's attractiveness, people's social profiles. And this was something that we built kind of just for ourselves because we thought it would be funny. Um, the, the way that, that Siki describes creating Friends for Sale was that he went to Las Vegas one weekend. And um, he remembered being outside of the nightclub. I think at the time, Tao Nightclub was really hot in Las Vegas. And there's, there's a door at Tao Nightclub. And on the left side of the door is the VIP entrance, where all of the gentlemen who want to buy tables and bottles for the evening line up. And they have a lot of money. And they, they put a lot of money down to enter the club first. And on the right side of the door was a line of all the most beautiful girls that the promoters from the club had picked from the longer line of general uh, entrance. And so he looked at this image, and he saw an idea. He saw, oh, I can make this. I can make this on the internet. Um, and so Friends for Sale was something that we built over 10 days um, in late October of 2007. Uh, we hit the Go button after 10 days of development, and it kind of became a small phenomena on Facebook at the time. Facebook only had about maybe 50 million users. I think they're up to over 700 million users now. So the scale of Facebook was very different, and the, the people that were on Facebook were very different. This concept might be uh, a little bit offensive today on today's Facebook, because you know everybody's mom and grandma's on Facebook. But, <laughs> but at the time, Facebook was mostly young people um, straight out of college or still in college, and a lot of people in the tech uh, you know, in the tech world. And so Friends for Sale ended up uh, making it to be the top five or six app on the platform at the time. We peaked at about a million daily users. Um, and over the course of the application, we reached 100 million users. And so that was kind of the first step into becoming an entrepreneur. And, and actually, it was really accidental for me, because I had, I had wanted to always be an entrepreneur, but I never took that initial step that really pushes you over the edge. It was always like one of those dreams that you have that you never act on. At least it was for me. And Friends for Sale kind of took off overnight. It was, it was viral, and viral was a word that was just being born at that time. And we ended up building a company to support Friends for Sale because it became too big for two people to support on their own. And, and my co-founder, Siki, was actually a, a good uh, a good motivator for me, because he was much more entrepreneurial, and I, I ended up learning a lot from him. Um, so after building Friends for Sale, we uh, built Serious Business. This is a picture of some of the, the engineers and artists that worked with us at Serious Business. Um, Serious Business was a company of about 35 people. Uh, we were headquartered in the, cities on, in, in the city on Market Street. 
And uh, we had a lot of fun building stupid stuff on the internet. Um, that's the way I describe it. Uh, but the company supported Friends for Sale as well as multiple games that we developed afterwards. And this was really the formative, kind of the formative stage of my life. Um, building a company was, was something that happened to me and it's an opportunity that I'm really glad that we took on. Um, I remember that at the time, there were a lot of other entrepreneurs doing social game startups in 2008, 2007 and 2008 and a lot of them are still friends with me and I, I see a lot of people who went different ways with their uh, life. Uh, some people sold their company right away some people never took venture capital. Um, and Siki and I decided to take venture capital and kind of live the dream um, of being a venture-backed startup. And uh, it's really interesting to see how certain people have turned out. Some people are still doing the independent thing and they've made a ton of money doing that. There are people who sold companies in 2007 and now they're founders of massive companies today. Um, a notable one being uh, Suleiman Ali of, of uh, Tinyco. Um, he actually sold a company in 2007 to SGN. He waited out his non-compete period and then he started another gaming company in 2009 and they're seeing a lot of success today. So uh, it was really, it was, it was kind of, in a way, it was my version of business school because I never went to business school. It was a small group of people all on the same platform, all kind of trying to figure out how things work and Facebook kind of united us as a group of people and um, it's been really interesting to see that kind of class of people um, make success throughout the world. Um, so we operated serious business from 2008 till 2010. We raised six, five or six million dollars in venture capital. I forget how it works because of all the terms that get attached. Um, and eventually we were acquired by Zynga. So, uh, this is the part of the story I can't talk a lot about for um, SEC filing reasons. Um, but uh, we ran the company for two years. Zynga approached us multiple times throughout the time we were um, operating as a company. And at the time that they acquired us, um, social gaming had, had kind of shaken out a little bit. Um, there weren't a lot of independent companies left and Zynga was pretty clearly the dominant player. And so it was kind of a, if you can't beat them, join them type of situation. Um, at the time we were fielding a lot of inbound acquisition offers, but we knew that if we had joined Zynga, then we had the most opportunity to actually leverage what we've learned as a company for, for two years. And the social gaming space is, you know, it didn't exist four years ago. So the, the actual expertise that the team had built up was pretty valuable and um, Zynga was going to be able to use that better than anyone else. I can't lie, I did consider for a second, you know, taking a really low offer from Blizzard because it would have been incredibly cool to work at Blizzard, but um, they didn't really get social gaming. And I, I remember actually one um, exploratory meeting where Blizzard came in and they brought in a bunch of execs to our office room and we were demoing a new title that we were building. And, and Facebook games in 2010 even still were very rudimentary. Um, this was during 2009 that we were talking to Blizzard. And they were just HTML games. They were like, I don't know if you guys have played Mafia Wars, but it's just a web page with buttons that you click over and over and over and over again. And that was a game in 2009. Um, and I'll talk more about why that like qualified as a game. But a lot of people clearly didn't get it. I mean, Blizzard makes World of Warcraft, the, you know, one of the biggest games of all time, uh, most profitable games of all time. And I remember being all excited to show our prototype of our new HTML game that we spent a lot of time on. It was state of the art for at least HTML. And we showed the demo, we clicked a couple buttons and the, uh, I think it was the CFO or one of the financial guys said, that's it. Um, so <laughs> those talks didn't go quite as well. I think Zynga understood us a lot more than, than anyone. And um, so that's why we ended up working at Zynga. Um, and after joining Zynga, uh, they took our team of about 30 people, 35 people, and they split us up into two groups. Um, my co-founder went on to create uh, Treasure Isle with his group of uh, serious, former serious business people, and my group ended up uh, making Cityville. And so Cityville was something I worked on over the past year and a half. Um, it's been kind of uh, also a very important um, 
stage of learning in my life, and uh, I've learned I've learned what it's like to to run kind of a pretty big organization inside of Zynga. Cityville on its own is is kind of a bigger startup than my startup ever was, and it has to operate like a startup in a lot of ways. And so, Cityville was was a great experience for me. Um, I can't really say much more than that. Um, so, before we get to the meat of the talk, I want to give a disclaimer. Um, I think uh, most of the time when um, you get advice, um, it's mostly that person connecting the dots in the past, and this is a quote from Steve Jobs about connecting the dots looking backwards. It's, it's really hard to figure out which advice to take, so I would say that um, your mileage may vary with this advice. Um, a lot of this stuff is stuff I would have told myself four years ago, and if it was myself telling me, I would have done it because I believe myself, but I had already heard all of this advice before. So, um, as I said, your mileage may vary. Um, so, five things I learned uh, in the last five years. Um, fake it till you make it, pick the right co-founder, replace yourself, um, and the last two points are kind of product strategy points. So the first, the first three are kind of just uh, tactics for um, being an entrepreneur, and the last two are specific to um, trends in consumer products that I think are emerging. So thing one, uh, fake it till you make it. Um, this this saying has uh, means a lot to me. I think, um, and this is kind of the facetious version of the saying. I think a more appropriate one might be "act as if," and uh, this is a saying that basically means um, if you put yourself in situations that you're not prepared for, but you act like you're prepared for it, chances are you'll rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. And um, this is probably more about faking it to yourself than faking it to other people. I'm not advocating that any of you lie to anyone. Uh, but definitely, if you guys put yourselves outside of your comfort zone, um, you'll be able to rise to the occasion. And so, for me, every good opportunity that's happened in my career um, has been an opportunity that I wasn't ready for when I started it. This goes back to, you know, my first job in college was I worked at a computer store um, selling computers, and I was a computer science student, but I had just started. I was never really into computers growing up, and so my uh, manager at the computer store needed some programming done in the back, and I told him I'm a computer science student, and he said, well, then you should do it. And so I kind of got my first job in programming, um, figuring out how to program for this job. Um, this was like freshman year of college. I had taken like an intro to CS course, and I didn't know anything at all. Um, but I think for myself and for a lot of people, um, you'll end up acting in a way that is congruent with what people believe out of you. And so if you put yourself in situations where people believe something out of you, you'll find yourself pushing to make that happen. And so that's the first example. Every good thing that's happened to me has been as a result of me putting myself, saying yes to an opportunity that I wasn't ready for, and figuring it out along the way. And I, I think that might be just specific to certain people. Some people just operate that way. Um, I know that that was the best way for me to get motivated is to have the pressure of you know, uh, letting someone down. And I, I never want to let people down. So um, fake it till you make it is kind of the most important thing that I've ever learned. And I'm going to continue faking it until I can't make it anymore. Someday, like the worst thing that can happen is you'll fake it and you'll find your limit. And that's not such a terrible thing. So um, a couple things that go along with that is um, I think a, a really common saying is luck is an opportunity, uh, is opportunity meeting preparation. But I don't really think that's true. I don't think you can be prepared for all the things that could happen to you in your life. And so saying yes to a lot of things is going to get you more opportunities. You're going to, you're going to be a lot luckier. Um, and I feel pretty lucky being able to be here to talk to you guys. And I think that's because of me saying yes. And this, this image is from a movie, uh, kind of a dumb Jim Carrey movie called Yes Man. But if you guys haven't watched it, I would urge you to watch it. It's, it's pretty funny, and uh, I think it illustrates the point well. Saying yes to things is, um, is a good way to find the opportunities that you want in your life. Um, as I said before, I'll, I'll reiterate, don't fake it too hard. Don't, 
<laughs> lie to people. Don't overstate your abilities so badly. I, I think if there was a comfort zone, you should, and this is your comfort zone, you should be like just a little bit outside of it, not, not too far outside of it. And, and you'll see that um, you'll, you'll find your way. Um, and I want to give you some practical advice on faking it. So um, these, are, these are fake handbags. They're pretty good, actually. Um, when I was in Hong Kong, I bought some fake handbags. I brought them home. Nobody was you know, any the wiser. Um, I think for faking it, you can learn a lot from Chinese counterfeiters. Um, <laughs> um, every time that I faked it and I had to make it, um, I learned by basically copying somebody or copying something. Um, whether that was my first job and I was just copying lines out of a textbook to figure out how to code, or it was my time at Serious Business when I had to suddenly go from being CTO to the lead product designer, and I had to figure out you know, how to make things look nice and to design. And, um, I literally took the Apple website and figured out how to copy it pixel by pixel. Like I drew every pixel of the Apple website in Photoshop, and I learned a lot in that process. So I think the first practical tip to faking it is just to copy somebody. And I don't think there's any shame in copying anyone, um, or even stealing. I think, I think it was, <laughs> I think it was um, Van Gogh that said, bad artists copy, good artists steal, or something like that. Um, so I think, I think it's a really great way to, to figure out um, what you're capable of. And the process of doing things uh, really is how you figure out how things work. So as menial as it sounds, like if you want to learn to draw, just trace. If you want to learn to code, just write code, as, you know, copy somebody's code for as long as you can and figure out how it works. And I think you guys will see a lot of success. So that's the first tip. Fake it till you make it or act as if. Uh, thing two is pick the right co-founder. I spoke kind of briefly about Siki, my co-founder, at the beginning of the talk. And um, I was really fortunate to, to work with such a great co-founder. Um, he's uh, still at Zynga, and he's going on to do great things at Zynga. And I know he'll go on to do great things in his life. And hopefully, be, we'll be able to work together again. I don't have any advice on how to pick the right co-founder, because I got really lucky. Like We just kind of became friends. And the first project we ever worked on turned into our biggest success ever. So. I got lucky, and I know get lucky is not really good advice, but I can at least tell you why it's really important for you to figure out how to pick the right co-founder. Um, there are a lot of things that we went through that, I'll, that I can tell you about, and there's a lot of literature on the internet about you know, picking a co-founder. Um, you can definitely read some essays by Paul Graham, who talks about it a lot. Um, I mean, if you just search like picking co-founders on Google, you'll find as much advice as you could ever want. Uh, but specific to my experience, um, Picking the right co-founder was really important because co-founders give you moral support, and startups are probably the hardest thing that I've ever done in my life. This is, this is kind of a, a graph of what it's like to be in a startup. Imagine this, but every couple days it happens over and over and over again for the entire time you're a startup. And the, that bubble number three that says crisis of meaning, like it's real. When your startup is in danger of dying, you feel like you are going to die too. Um, I mean, startups, a startup is, a, is an entity, and there's nobody to feel the emotions of that entity more than the founders, because everything rides on their shoulders. And when you're a, a sole co-founder, a sole founder, I've never done that, but I know I talk to a lot of them. It's really hard not to have an equal partner in trying to figure out you know, this new business endeavor. So. You'll be glad you have a co-founder when you get to the crisis of meaning. That's when you, that's when you really understand. And um, there's a lot of cliches that, that I've heard throughout my life that you'll probably hear or have already heard that don't make sense until you've been through it. And so like, there, people will say things like, oh, picking a co-founder is like picking a spouse. Like, I totally understand that. But it meant zero to me the first time I heard it. Um, I've been through more with my co-founder probably than any human being on Earth. Um, so it's, it's really important to find somebody that you can really trust um, and get through things with. Um, and I think Mark Andreessen says it a lot better than, than I can. Um, I'll just read it out, because it's a really great quote. First and foremost, 
A startup puts you on an emotional roller coaster unlike anything you've ever experienced. You flip rapidly from day to day, one where you're euphorically convinced you're going to own the world to a day in which doom seems only weeks away and you feel completely ruined and back again, over and over and over. And I'm talking about what happens to stable entrepreneurs. So um, I'm sure if some of you have started companies, this will ring true. I hope if you haven't started companies, you really take this, uh, th this advice. Um, having a co-founder is, is going to help you get through those moments when you would otherwise probably go crazy. Um, and there are a lot of practical benefits to having a co-founder as well, not just the emotional support and the moral support, but making decisions as a startup is, is really difficult because you have to make decisions that affect your life, probably the lives of dozens or hundreds, hopefully, of employees that you have, and the lives of hopefully millions of users that you have. And you have to make those decisions daily. And there's nobody else to make those decisions except for the founders. And so having somebody to help you with strategic decision making is really, really, really important. Decisions are hard to make. Um, and it's easier to be the decider when you have a sounding board that is your equal. When you have a startup, you'll definitely have venture capitalists, board members. You'll have employees. You'll have people that you can use as a sounding board. But nobody is as in it as an equal co-founder. And nobody's going to give you advice as meaningful as an equal co-founder. So I would say picking a co-founder is, is one of the most important things uh, you can do. OK, thing number three. Um, th this is, and these are roughly in chronicle, chronological order. So thing number three is something uh, my co-founder and I realized as we were running the company for the few years that we ran it. Um, like I said before, nobody cares more about the success of your startup than you as the founder. And what that, what's going to end up doing to you is it's going to drive you to figure out all the inefficiencies in your business. It's going to drive you to do all the things that aren't getting done in the business. You're going to do whatever it takes. And we were in this cycle of just wearing a million hats or 500 hats for you know, well over a year before we noticed a pattern. And we would drive ourselves crazy trying to do all these jobs, whether it was you know, designing the UI or doing the accounting or being the lead engineer or being an engineering manager. Um, what we realized is, is you'll wear so many hats as the founder, and that's your job as the founder is to fill in the gaps. But when you've been doing something for too long, that's when you know you have to hire for it. So this is a really practical piece of advice. Um, it's really easy to not know how to build an organization when it's your first time around. And this rule of thumb really worked out for us when we were building ours. And it continues to serve me today. Whenever you've been doing something for too long, you need to hire somebody to do that. And the good thing is, once you've been doing it for long enough, you're going to be really good at evaluating somebody to do it for you. So this is a really great way as the founder of the company to stay kind of abreast of everything that's happening in your company, um, but also figuring out um, how do you keep yourself sane and how to, to, uh, to stay balanced? Uh, thing number four. So this is, this is getting to the product strategy section of the talk. Um, one thing that we noticed when we were building out our games, and as I said before, these games were like barely games. They were HTML web pages where you clicked a button and you went to a new page that told you what happened. It was basically like choose your own adventure on the internet. And there's not that much high tech to it. Um, but somehow we were getting a ton of usage. We were getting millions and millions of users. People were paying us tons and tons of money for us to give them these web pages. Like, I, I actually want to stress that for a second. We had, we had a romance novelist who was addicted to our game Friends for Sale because she loved the attention of getting bought by people and she loved buying people. And the way we made money was that we sold the virtual currency you used to buy people. Over her lifetime, she spent 30,000 US dollars buying fake money to buy people on the internet. Um, and we couldn't figure out for the longest time why this was. <laughs> it was really bizarre to us, and it still kind of is bizarre to me, but what we kind of boiled it down to was that access matters almost more than anything. At least for the types of games we were building, access mattered more than, you know, I mean, social is really important, but like if you, if you strip away all the really obvious things, like yeah, it's social, yeah, you had good distribution, 
access, access was really important. And but what I mean by access is high availability. Like people could reach these games anytime they wanted, when they were at work, in between phone calls, when they were supposed to be doing other things. They were able to play this, and because we were high access, they couldn't they couldn't you know open up Gears of War or something in the middle of the workday or World of Warcraft. But they could pretty saltily open up Friends for Sale, make a couple transactions, and then hop back out. And so access. Um, was the way that we were able to get a foothold in kind of the entertainment industry. Um, we were creating a new form of entertainment that was more accessible. Um, and it was definitely lower fidelity. I mean, even today, Zynga games are pretty, pretty incredible, but like, if you take a screenshot of Cityville and hold it up to a screenshot of like Years of War, there's like no comparison. The fidelity levels is, are, are completely different, but Zynga has access going for it, and I think that's, that's one of the ways we were able to get a foothold. So, so specifically, I'm, I'm talking about this versus this, right? This, this is World of Warcraft. Um, I don't know how many of you played it, but I played it in college. I actually made, I actually remember being a college student and I was so stupid. I, I consciously made a decision to myself. I said, okay, you can buy World of Warcraft, but you know that means you're not gonna have a girlfriend for like a couple years. <laughs> and I said, Let's do this. <laughs> so, so the reason the reason that is is because World of Warcraft is a high fidelity immersive experience. You spend hours at a time playing it. I remember losing entire weekends to this game where I would just be in the game for the whole weekend. And this is high fidelity but super low access. You can only access it when you make a conscious decision to shut away other parts of your life, like having a girlfriend, which probably would have been something I wanted to do in college. So I wish social games existed during college because social games are, and, and other new forms of entertainment that I'll talk about, are a much more accessible way to uh, get to your entertainment. So the, the really interesting thing about it too is that because because society is kind of getting a shorter and shorter attention span. I don't know if any of you have younger siblings, but if you notice, they all have like way shorter attention spans than you do. Um, society in general is moving this way. And I, re I remember reading studies that, that uh, researchers did on web users. People who use the web, their brains are wired differently when they're put in MRI machines to like to do some you know, image recognition exercise. Their brains work differently than people who have never used the web. They ended up taking those people who don't use the web and asked them to use the web for one hour a day for a week. And after that week, those people's MRI scans looked exactly the same as the people who've been using web their whole life. So I think, I think there's something to the way the society is moving to having, uh, you know, we're a multitasking, time slicing society. And to the extent that you can build experiences like this, where people can access it for five minutes at a time, you're going to find new hours in the day to reach your consumers that didn't used to exist. Um, because WoW is continuing to soar. Like, we didn't put a dent in WoW at all. I don't think any of social gaming did. Um, you know, primetime television is still doing really well. I mean, it's, it's wavering a little bit. But by and large, the reason we didn't have to take away from somebody else to gain a lot of uh, exposure to consumers is because we were finding new hours in the day. This is, this is a graph of Friends for Sales. Um, page views by hour. And so what, what, what you can see is we were spiking right around 8 in the morning, and we continue to be pretty strong throughout the afternoon. And that's because people, and this was even most, more pronounced on Monday, because people, a lot of people don't use the computer over the weekend, but that they log in on Monday and they want to check their account. So what we noticed was we were getting all of our peak usage during the workday. And this was something that was like super mind-boggling to people like that, that interviewed us, at, like Blizzard interviewed us, and they couldn't understand that we were stealing from work hours. We weren't stealing from <laughs> World of Warcraft hours. Um, it, was, it was all workday hours that, that were being wasted. So, <laughs> so I would say the biggest trend that I'm going to be latching on to that's non-obvious um, is, is access as a disruptive, as a way to disrupt. Um, because when you're competing against Excel or you know, waiting in line at the bus stop or whatever, a web page is all you need. All you need is a, a web page with a little bit of interesting content on it, maybe some social stuff. Um, and that's, that's kind of how we got our foothold. And that's the beginning. I think, 
I think after you get the foothold, after you get people's attention, then you start increasing investment. Then you start building up the fidelity of your product. Then you, then you create an experience that can actually rival you know, primetime television or Gears of War. And, and you kind of see this happening all over the world, like all over the industry. Uh, cell phones is a great example of this. Mobile is the ultimate high availability device. And if, if there isn't a mobile, if, there, if, the, uh, if the dating companies that are dominant on the web right now aren't aggressively pursuing a mobile strategy, they're going to be supplanted. Like, it's inevitable. Um, time spent on e-dating has increased over the past couple of quarters substantially because it's really easy to just pull out your phone and look at pictures of people you might want to date. Um, and you can do that multiple times throughout the day. And it's all about access. I think, I think this, is more this is the most important point I'll talk about, it, especially in, in the realm of dating. I, I've been following a lot of dating startups lately. And a lot of people are really focused on you know, location-based dating or some other feature of the, the phone that is important to them. But they don't focus enough on the fast 30-second experience that you can pull out of your pocket and put back in your pocket right away. Um, so you'll see this all over the world, uh, all over the industry. Um, another example is YouTube. YouTube is a really high availability service. It's on-demand video. You can watch those videos anytime you want. There are a lot of entertainers that are starting to put content out on YouTube, and the content is really low fidelity. It's just a guy interviewing people on the street. And it's not even as funny as like Jay Leno's man on the street stuff or anything like that. But because you can access it anytime, and he can post those videos all the time, he's getting millions and millions of views. And um, access is definitely going to be the way that, that uh, you are going to be able to reach your consumers without you know, catching the notice of a lot of other people, without actively taking away from other, from other competitors. Um, thing number five. So thing number five is don't get lost in the data. Um, I think it's, it's fairly well known that Zynga is a very data-driven company. And the social game space in general is a very data-driven space. There's a couple reasons for that, I think. Um, there's a specific nuance to the way that data is reported by Facebook. Facebook reports data about all of the apps that, that are being used um, on Facebook. So if you have an app that has an integration with Facebook, Facebook is going to publicly report data about your usage. So everybody in the world knows that, you know, Cityville has 100 million monthly users and Friends for Sale had a million daily users. This was all public data. The really terrible thing was this is public data for your consumers too. I mean, for your competitors too. So what this did was this created a really bright light on just the numbers. And when there's such a bright light focus on just the numbers, people tend to try to optimize those numbers. So the whole social gaming space is very data-driven. I'd say more data-driven than almost any other industry. Um, if you look at other industries, if you look at other startups, you know, you might be able to look at compete numbers, but those are, I don't even know how those are, those are calculated. Um, there's just not a lot of public data. So those companies have the luxury of, of kind of focusing on other things instead of the numbers. But Zynga and my company didn't have that luxury. We were very data-driven. Um, this is a quote from Mark Pincus. Uh, we record more than one petabytes a day uh, of data every single day. That's one million gigabytes. That's a lot of data. We have massive data centers. I can't talk more about that, so I'll stop talking about that. But there's a lot of data. And data has been a really transformative tool for the social gaming space. Um, gaming traditionally has very, very much been about the designer and the design. And there's a cult of design in the traditional gaming space. When you meet designers at like um, game conferences, they kind of like carry themselves like they are badasses. And they are because they had to figure out all of the hard things without any data. You know, like in the traditional console space, you would launch a title, you would get zero back. You would get maybe qualitative, like qualitative information in the form of emails people might write to you. But that is it. And so data was really great for the gaming space to figure out not only, you know, how, how can we leverage the intuition of these game designers with what people are actually doing. And so data is really great for giving you a new perspective. At Serious Business, actually, we didn't, we didn't always measure. Um, this is a graph of uh, our visitors over time from the time we launched to close to the time we sold the company. Um, 
I would say we got really lucky in our first initial spike and the novelty of our idea carried us pretty far. The idea of buying and selling your friends is pretty, pretty interesting. Um, but shortly after we closed funding, we, we couldn't keep it up because we weren't paying close enough attention to what people were actually doing. We weren't actively changing the service often enough to keep people engaged. And so when we started measuring things, we definitely started to see a huge increase. Our revenue went up like four times. Um, our page views went up by double. Um, and measurement really transformed us. And one really practical point for that is the things that we wanted to change, the things that we wanted to improve, we would put on monitors through our whole, our whole office. So our whole, whole office was just graphs of like revenue today by hour. And Sure enough, when you show that every day, people in your office will figure out ways to improve it. I don't even know if it was like conscious that they would do it, but like subconsciously or however, our revenue started to improve. They were starting to make changes that would really increase these numbers. So as a, as a really practical point, I would say definitely measure things and definitely put what you want to improve up on the board. But um, consumer products are ultimately about entertaining people. And fun and entertainment is really hard to measure. Um, so make sure that you don't lose sight of the original reason you were building something. Hopefully you guys will build things that you have like a personal <coughs> intuition or feel for or a personal affinity for. Um, I really recommend that as a first time entrepreneur. I think um, entrepreneurs that have done multiple companies, maybe they can figure out a really big macro strategy and build a company to attack that, you know, to attack that market, but I think that's because they have so much experience about how to build these things and they have so much intuition already. For a first time entrepreneur like myself, I found that my best successes were always when I was able to couple data with kind of a strong intuition of what I already knew I wanted. To the, the two, I only have two data points, but the two data points are Friends for Sale, which was something I built for myself, and Cityville, which is a game that I wanted to build, I've always wanted to build. I've always been into city building games. So those two, were my biggest successes, and I think that's largely because I was able to be intuition driven a lot more than I was data driven. Um, data supported, but, but uh, data informed, I would say, but um, definitely intuition driven. Um, fun is hard to measure, social is hard to measure. These things are, are, are not things that you're gonna read out on a graph and know that you're on your way to success. It's really hard to measure your way to this, and especially because a lot of times you'll have to build a product without the fortune of having any data. Like you may not have that many users or it may take you a long time to get to your first prototype. You have to have enough intuition to get you to your first build. And after you get to your first build, you really have to avoid the local maxima problem. So without intuition driving you, you could really easily get stuck at a local maxima. You, you're gonna be there and every direction that you turn, every change that you make is going to tell you that it's not panning out but you have to know kind of at a gut level that you have to bear through some of the low points to get to the ultimate high point. And there's no data that is going to tell you how to get there. This is, this is something you can really only figure out if you know what you're building and, and uh, you know how to get to the, to the um, best design. So those are kind of my five things. Um, I'll close again with the quote from Steve Jobs. Um, have, how many of you, have you guys seen the Stanford commencement address? Okay, so most of you. This is, this is probably, um, th th there's so many good quotes from that address and um, I, I think a really important thing that I got from that um, is that it's really important to have some other reason to keep doing what you're doing every day. I think if you're too outcome dependent, if you care too much about what the ultimate outcome is of whatever endeavor you're going through, there's too much chance for you to be disappointed by it. And as long as you're waking up every day enjoying what you're going to about to embark on, you'll be able to look back and connect the dots and be pretty happy with, with your result. Um, so I would urge you guys to watch it if you haven't, or watch it again if you already have. It's a great talk, and that's it. So if there's any questions. Uh, hi. So uh, co-leadership is usually very hard to deal with in certain aspects. So uh, I'm just wondering how you uh, coordinate with your collaborator, your co-founder, to play different roles in uh, leadership. Yeah. 
Um, as a, I have a few practical points about that. Um, my co-founder and I were equal in equity, and behind closed doors, we were pretty equal in decision making. But to the to the company, we we were not. So he was the CEO of the company. He was the chief executive. I reported to him for for the purposes of the organizational structure. And and actually, there were a lot of times where I would I would cede my ideas to his. Um, so for the most part. Um, we played it that way. He was the CEO, he was the ultimate decider, and I was a sounding board for him for a lot of things. This works out really well for a couple of reasons. Um, good cop, bad cop is something like we used all the time, and I think everyone should really study how good cop, bad cop works. It is a really fantastic tool for all kinds of things, not just interrogating suspects, but like for for a lot of things, it, uh, from making decisions about our employees, you know, um, to how we negotiated our acquisition. So, so we were definitely equals by equity, but the, from the looks of it, he was a CEO and I was a CTO. So I reported to him. Yeah. One more question. Um, thank you. So um, uh, in your slides, uh, one one slide you mentioned there is a curve, that when you start a company, um, the curve goes up, and at uh, some point, it goes down. And uh, when you meet a crisis, if you do not handle it good, then uh, maybe you go to bankrupt. But if you handle it good, then you take off from the ground. So I wonder whether you have met any crisis but, uh, when you start up a company, and uh, how do you recover from this crisis? And, uh, uh, it, and does um, your co-founder help you uh, from this cri crisis? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I think probably the, the biggest um, crisis we faced was we started a company kind of in, in late 2007, early 2008, and the financial crisis happened shortly thereafter. So like before the financial crisis, it was like all happy days. Like people were just like writing checks left and right. We got lucky enough to like get one of those checks. Um, but as soon as the financial crisis hit, you know, like everything shut down and we weren't sure if we were going to be able to make revenue or if we were going to be able to raise another round of funding if we needed it. So that was one of our most difficult crises, crises, I don't know how to say that word. Um, we ended up having to do a round of layoffs. So we had grown the company to about 26, 27 people. And then the word came down that we had to make sure that we had enough runway to operate the company through the crisis. So we raised like five million, we had burned a little bit of it, and we had to make sure we had enough money to run the company for like three years. Um, four million, five million is not that much money when you have 30 people. Like a really quick way to calculate that is each person in your company will, will burn about $10,000 a month, all included. So salary, benefits, all the auxiliary expenses. So you know, a couple million is, is not that much for a company over 20 people. And so we had to go through layoffs. I know, I remember we planned our layoffs. Well, we had to deliberate about doing the layoffs or not. Um, my co-founder and I, we worked really hard to figure out how to do the layoffs, how to do it in a way that would be least impactful to everyone, how we would be able to land people at different jobs. And so that was one of those, those times that we had kind of a really tough decision to make. But, but that, that graph is supposed to be representative of like, every couple days. Like you'll get a crisis every couple days where you'll feel like hopeless. And the reason that the graph looks like that is because every couple days you'll think of like some idea that's gonna save you and you're like convinced. You're like, oh my God, this idea is gonna be the best. And then you code it up and then you put it out there and then you realize, wait, this idea was not that good. And then that's when you start going back into the trough of the crisis of meaning. So we felt this pain kind of every single day, every couple days, because we were, we were running at one point four different games, and all of the games were struggling except for Friends for Sale, and so we had to figure out, you know, on a daily, weekly basis, how to make these games grow past, you know, what they were doing today. Thank you very much, Alex. <laughs>